pray with me one more time before we start. Father in heaven, Lord, we've asked for your spirit to be here today. We know that you hear us. Lord, this message, these messages are so important for the times in which we're living. Lord, we pray that our minds will be opened, that we won't hear the voice of a man, but we'll hear your voice speaking to our hearts, and that Christ is uplifted in everything, Lord. So please bless us with your wonderful spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a hot August day in 1879, and the Castle family was living in northern Michigan. There in northern Michigan, they experienced drought for some time. They had no rain. And all of you, I'm sure, living here in the Northwest know, know what it means when you have drought and no rain and a lot of evergreen trees. What is the thing that you're most concerned about? Forest fire. And the day came when the Castle family looked out and they saw the forest fire on the horizon. And they knew that danger was, was there. Now, of course, in 1879, they didn't have the modern fire departments like we have. And they didn't have airplanes to sweep over, a National Guard to come and try to put the fire out. It was every man for himself back then. And there they are living near the forest and they see the fires in the distance. They see the smoke. They know the fire is coming. And so they start making preparation, getting water, to, water together, you know, taking care of the animals, getting everything ready because they know there's a forest fire coming. And as the, as the sky gets dark, as they start smelling the smoke, as the little em <coughs> embers are being blown in their direction, another thing happens, the animals start moving. Now you know in a forest fire the animals move, and the animals are no longer afraid of people, they're just doing whatever they can to survive. Their instinct tells them there is great danger in the forest fire, we've got to go. So the animals are moving through, and the castles had a seven-year-old boy who was standing outside, and as he sees the animals moving through, he sees a large buck standing there, kind of sniffing in defiance towards the direction of the forest fire. And besides the large buck, there is a young fawn, as if standing next to its father. And the little boy noticed how calm and peaceful the fawn seemed to be in the face of danger when the fawn was in the presence of its father. And it struck him that that's how we should be in the presence of our Heavenly Father. We shouldn't be afraid. We should be calm and trusting. So going inside the house, he knelt down and he prayed. Dear Jesus, you know there is a forest fire out there. You know it's coming our direction. Lord, would you please send the rain, to, the wind to blow it the other direction and the rain to put it out. And after he had prayed, he felt better, and he got up, and he went to his mother, and he says, Mother, there is going to be rain. And mother says, Son, it has not rained for so long. What makes you say that? There's not a cloud in the sky. And he said, Because I prayed to Jesus, and I've asked Jesus to send the rain. Later he went out and talked to his father, who's getting the barrel of water ready to try to fight the forest fire around their house. And he says, Father, it's going to rain. And the father says, son, it doesn't look like rain to me. And the boy says, but I've asked Jesus, and Jesus is going to send the rain. Well, that evening, the young boy went to sleep, perfectly trusting that his father in heaven had heard his prayer. And after he went to sleep, they heard the thunder overhead, and then the rains came, saving the family home and <clears throat> putting the fire in the other direction. The rains came in answer to the prayer of faith from a small seven-year-old boy who trusted that his father would hear him when he prayed. There's talk today about a drought, not a physical drought, but a spiritual drought within the church, and the need for God's people to have the wind of the Holy Spirit and the latter rain to put out, to end the drought. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. 
and the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now, in the Bible talks about the early and the latter rain. It reminds us of Palestine, where the early rain was linked with the time of planting, and the early rain would come to help spring up the crops. Then right before harvest, the latter rain would come to finish the ripening process and prepare the crops for harvest. The Bible speaking of the early and the latter rain, or the former and the latter rain, is speaking about the spiritual rain, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the gift of God upon His people. And in the Bible, we see the example of the early rain, or the former rain, coming in Acts chapter 2, the New Testament church, where the Holy Spirit came upon the waiting disciples, and they went out and did the work of the Lord. The latter rain is very similar to the early rain. Now in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 we read, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. This was the beginning of the early rain. Now we want to ask the question, why were the disciples all together in one place at this time? What was it that had brought them together? What event had happened that had at first shattered their hopes, had shaken them mightily, and then pulled them together? The cross of Christ. Jesus had died. Now, did the disciples, had they expected that Jesus would die? No, they didn't expect it. Should they have expected it? Why? Because Jesus told them. Jesus told them what was going to happen. In fact, he tried to tell them over and over and over, but the disciples weren't listening. Why were they not listening? Do you remember what their, in their hearts they were always arguing about? Who would be the greatest? So in their hearts, they were more concerned about the here and now than knowing from the Lord what really was going to happen. Their thoughts were centered on a very earthly kingdom where I will be great. I will be the great one. And as the Lord tried to speak to them the truth, they filtered out what he said by their own preconceived ideas and their desires to be like the world around them. So when the shaking came to the little group of disciples, they weren't expecting it and they weren't ready for it, even though Jesus had tried to warn them. Afterwards, when Christ went to heaven and he asked the disciples to come together and pray in the upper room till the Holy Spirit came upon them, the disciples were there praying and we can imagine what they must have been thinking. Something like this. Oh, look, just think. We had been with Christ for three and a half years. We ate with him. We walked with him. We talked with him. We slept with him. We were with the Son of God. All the things that we could have done for him all the things we could have learned of Him and through Him, and yet we wasted our time over and over and over by self-thinking, thinking about what we wanted, what we could get out of it. And with repentance, as they reflected on their own actions, they thought, Lord, we are so sorry. We blew the opportunity you gave us. We could have done much for Christ when He was upon this earth, when we walked with Christ. And now it's over. Lord, please give us a chance to really make Christ known. And it's in that spirit of reflection and repentance that the prayer was heard and the Holy Spirit came upon the waiting disciples. In verse 2 says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What happened? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You know, we talk about it. We pray about it. But do we understand what it really means to be filled with the Holy Spirit? To have the joy and the confidence and the power and the love to go out and to do the things of God, to do the work God would have us to do, to go with the joy and the happiness that God is providing for us. This is what the disciples experienced 
there in the upper room that day. And it spread out through all of <coughs> Jerusalem. Now, this is the experience of the early rain. And the latter rain is the other bookend of the early rain. And if we want to understand the latter rain, we look at the former rain. Okay? So that's what we're doing today. So today we want to look at five basic facts of the latter rain. Five basic facts of the latter rain, because this will be our building block over the next two subjects. And the first one we want to start with is the latter rain in its fullness is associated with the loud cry message of Revelation 18 and lightens the world with heaven's final warning. Now you have all heard the term the loud cry, correct? You've heard that term, the loud cry. What is the loud cry? It's the latter rain in its fullness. Now we've seen drops of the latter rain in our time, you know, where there's a great revival, where there's a great evangelistic meeting, or where hundreds, or maybe in some countries thousands, are converted, but these are drops, as it were, of the time that's coming when the loud cry and the latter rain comes in earnest. Revelation 18.1 says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. This angel is the angel of Revelation 18, comes to add power to the three angels' message to give earth's loud cry. But of course the angel is not literally giving the cry. The angel is helping to empower God's people to give the cry through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For God's people have to give that last loud cry filled with the Spirit like the early disciples were. Verse 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. You see, during the time of the latter rain and the loud cry, God is issuing a call to people who, his people who were in all of the various churches. Because God has his own people in all of these churches. But oftentimes, the churches themselves or the denominations are worshiping in error or they are teaching error. Nevertheless, God sends out in the last warning call, he asks his people to separate from error and to all come together. It's a polarization, you might say, of all of the world coming together on the world side or the devil's side and all of God's people from all the various churches uniting with God's remnant in truth for the very last conflict. During the loud cry, the church aided by the providential interpositions of her exalted Lord will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly that light will be communicated to every city and town. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of salvation. So abundantly will the renewing Spirit of God have crowned with success the intensely active agencies that the light of present truth will be seen flashing everywhere. Review and Herald, October 13, 1904. And it makes us think of the text that says in Habakkuk 2.14, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So oftentimes the gospel goes forward and it seems like there's always a power trying to hold it back. The devil is trying to hold back the gospel work. But in the end, at the time of the loud cry and the latter rain, there is nothing holding it back and it goes forth with great power. And all the world has the opportunity to know truth and to know Christ for themselves. And they have to make their decision. All right, <clears throat> latter, <clears throat> fact number two of the latter rain. The latter rain comes in its fullness at the commencement of earth's little time of trouble. Now, we've used that term for many years in the church, the little time of trouble. And we use that term to refer to a time just before the seven last plagues are poured out. When, earth, when the earth is suffering, when there's persecution, when the gospel is going, giving its last cry, the little time of trouble, but when we say the little time of trouble, it's really not little. It's really terrible, only exceeded by the seven last plagues that follow it. 
In Joel 2, 29 and 30, it says, And in those days will I pour out my spirit. That's the days of the latter rain. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. At the time of the latter rain, we find God speaking in judgment language, that at the same time the last cry is going out to the people, God's judgments are going into the earth. Not judgments without mercy, but judgments with mercy for those who can still be saved. Nevertheless, they're the greatest judgments earth has ever seen. In letter 23b, 1894, we read, In the time of confusion, and you're going to see that term over and over, the time between the time between the outpouring of the seven last plagues and the time between the start of persecution upon God's people. That time is termed a time of confusion because every wind of doctrine is blowing. The craziest things are happening in the world. God's judgments are in the land and people don't know what to do. In the time of confusion and trouble such as never was. Now why that's significant is because she uses here this term the time of confusion and trouble such as never was, and she's not referring to the seven last plagues. She's referring to that period of time just before, but that time is a great time of trouble. It, she says, the uplifted Savior will be presented to the people in all lands and in all places that all who look may live. This quote gives us a little glimpse into the time that's coming. The little time of trouble that is really terrible, but it's also the time of the loud cry and the latter rain. Early writings, page 41, we read, I saw that events come in order, war and rumors of war, sword, famine, and pestilence are first to shake the earth. So these are the troubles that will be coming upon the earth in the time of the latter rain, of the shaking and the latter rain. From Testimonies, Volume 1, page 268, I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in the utmost confusion. There's that word again, confusion. War, bloodshed, privation, want, famine, and pestilence were abroad in the land. As these things surrounded God's people, they began to press together and to cast aside their little difficulties. Now notice here that the troubles of earth come and God's people start getting together because of all the troubles that are around them. And the troubles include war, bloodshed, privation, famine, pestilence. She says self-dignity no longer controlled them. Deep humili humility took its place. Suffering, perplexity, and privation caused reason to resume its throne, and the passionate and unreasonable man became sane and acted with discretion and wisdom. My, my attention was then called from the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. You might say a time for the gospel work to be finished. Once more the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me, and again everything was in the utmost confusion. Strife, war, and bloodshed with famine and pestilence raged everywhere. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion. Now, so when she says other nations were engaged in it, then by default, she's saying, who else is engaged in it? Our nation. War caused famine. Now notice the cause-effect relationship of the troubles. War caused famine, all right? Want and bloodshed caused pestilence. And then men's hearts failed them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. You see the troubles that are coming during the little time of trouble. Fact number three, the latter rain is poured out after the troubles of earth shake God's church to its very foundation. The church itself is going to be shaking by the troubles that are coming. Now in Manuscript 64, 1910, this is one of those recently released ones, we're, <coughs> we're told, she says, Now I want to say that night after night there is presented before me that all at once affliction and sorrow and distress will be brought upon our people. All at once. Sometimes we're tempted to think, oh, the little time of trouble, it comes gradually, it gets worse and worse. Well, it may get worse and worse. It may be graduated, but it comes very quickly. 
It comes very quickly. The devil uses surprise for God's people who are sleeping, who are not aware that trouble is coming, or puts it farther off. May, you know, the devil uses the element of surprise to catch them off their guard. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1065. When the days come when the law of God is made void. So we're talking in context of the days when persecution starts against God's people. And the church is sifted by the fiery trials that are to try all that live upon the earth. A great proportion of those who are supposed to be genuine will give heed to seducing spirits and will turn traitors and betray sacred trusts. They will prove our very worst persecutors. In the time of the disciples, did they experience betrayal? Who was it that betrayed Jesus? It was Judas. Now, of the disciples, what kind of standing did Judas have? Judas was the financier. He was the administrator. He's the one that handled the purse. He was the treasurer. All right. If you ask the disciples during Jesus' time, if you had them alone in a room and you said, okay, now which one of you is the greatest disciple? Okay, let's, let's, if you ask them that question, they all wanted it for themselves, but they would have probably deferred to Judas because they looked at him as the educated one, the intelligent one, the sharp one. They looked at Judas as a leader. And who was it that betrayed them? Probably apart from Christ, the one that they had the most confidence in. And he was the betrayer. Incidentally, it's kind of interesting, is of the angels in heaven, apart from Christ, who did they have the most confidence in? Lucifer. And who was it that betrayed them? It was Lucifer. So the disciples experienced betrayal and even in the case of Peter, betrayed Christ themselves, though Peter repented and Judas did not. At the end of time, we will find betrayal again happening within God's church. People who do not have a consecrated walk with Christ. When the troubles come, they won't stand and they will turn, just like in the time of the disciples, Judas turning and betraying. Hosea 10.10 says, It is in my desire that I should chastise them, and the people shall be gathered against them. Now, during the time of persecution, even before the plagues are poured out, we find that the people are gathered, the world is gathered against God's people. In the time of Christ, it was the Pharisees and the Jews that were gathered against the disciples. But here it says, It is in my desire I should chastise them, and the people shall be gathered against them. Why is that? Verse 12, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Why is it that God allows sifting to come to the church? For the purpose of pulling together a united pure people that he can rain righteousness on. Verse, chapter 6 verse 1 tells us, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Notice here who is doing the tearing. The Lord is allowing the tearing and the shaking to come to the church for the purpose of bringing together one church all together in unity. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, it says in verse 3, His going forth is prepared as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. The Lord will come and visit His people with the latter rain when the church has been sifted and shaken. Testimonies, volume 5, page 80 tells us, The days are fast approaching when there will be great perplexity and confusion. There we have that word again. Satan clothed in angel robes will deceive, if possible, the very elect. Those who have trusted to intellect, genius, or talent will not then stand at the rank, head of rank and file. In other words, those who are trusting themselves, those who have all the natural gifts and trust themselves in not trusting in Christ will not stand at the head of the work at that time. Those who have proved themselves unfaithful will not then be entrusted with the flock. In the last solemn work, 
few great men will be engaged. They are self-sufficient, independent of God, and he cannot use them. You see, it is to God's honor and glory to take the farmer from the field who really does not understand the deep theological issues in Scripture and pour his spirit upon that farmer, and that farmer will wax more eloquently than the greatest learned doctor of our schools. Why is it? Because it's not human wisdom that's giving the message at that time. It's the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God can take anybody, regardless of their lack of intellect or knowledge, He can take anybody, fill them with the Spirit, and they will go out and teach the people the truth. Fact number four, the shaking of the church produces a repentance and drawing together of God's people unlike anything seen since apostolic times. Now, if we think back to the Old Testament, we think back to the children of Israel, was Israel called to be set apart? What were they called to be set apart to do? They were to be the light of the world. They were to reveal the truth about God to the world around them. Now, among the children of Israel, did you have a group called the Levites? Were they set apart? What were they set apart to do? Take care of the sanctuary, right? But in taking care of the sanctuary, what were they really doing? They were revealing the truth about God to those around them. Among the Levites, did you have the priests? Were the priests set apart? What were they set apart to do? They were set apart to lead out in the worship and sacrificial services. And in so doing, they were to be revealing the truth about God to those around them. Did Israel fulfill the mission God gave for them? They didn't. They were set apart to be the light of the world, but they didn't fulfill the mission. Why didn't they fulfill it? Because they wanted to be like all the other nations. Give us a king. Let us be like all the other nations around us. Their hearts were filled with the things of the world. And because of that, they were not able to do all that God would have had them to do. In the New Testament, we have the New Testament church. Was the New Testament church set apart? They were. What were they set apart to do? Reveal the truth about God, be a light to the world around them. In the New Testament church, did you have elders and deacons and apostles and disciples? You did. Were they all set apart? What were they set apart to do? Spread the word. Reveal the truth about God to those around them. In, God's la in the very last days, does God have a last day remnant church? Yes. Have they been set apart? What are they set apart to do? Reveal the truth about God to the dark world around them. In God's last day church, do you have elders and deacons and deaconesses? Are they set apart? Right. They're set apart to take care of the church, but in doing so, like the ancient Levites, they're really revealing the truth about God to those around them. Then do you have the ministry in the church, the ministers? Are they set apart? And once again, in leading out in ministry and worship, they are set apart to reveal the truth about God to those around them. Each time you see it gets deeper, deeper, deeper. But has God's church done all they could have done? Probably in Scripture, no one understood what it meant to be set apart than what we find in the story of Samson. For Samson was set apart for a very special purpose. What was he set apart to do? He was set apart to begin to deliver God's people. All right? He was set apart to deliver God's people, but Samson had an unusual quality. What was it that set him apart? Superhuman strength. Along with the strength, he was invincible. He could go against an army of a thousand men. Could they hurt him? No. They could throw their spears at him, shoot their bows and arrows. They could do whatever they wanted. They couldn't hurt Samson. Samson could just take them all down. Samson was invincible, but where did he get this power? As the Holy Spirit came upon him, 
as the Spirit of God came upon Samson, Samson had the power to do anything for the sake of God. Samson was a type of Christ. Samson was set apart, revealing how when the Spirit of God comes upon his people, his people can stand invincible against the powers of evil. But did Samson fulfill the work God gave him to do? Where was Samson's mind? His mind was in the world. In fact, it's probably best described in what he said to his parents when he said to them, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Talking about the Philistine women. Samson, though he was set apart, though he was given the Spirit of God, though he was made invincible in, a matter of, in, a, in some ways, Though he had all of this, yet though he was set apart, he didn't fulfill the work God had him to do because his mind was carried away with the things of the world, just like ancient Israel. When we talk about what it means to be set apart, to be set apart is to be reserved for holy use. It's to reveal a spirit of self-sacrifice. You see, Jesus ultimately reveals what it means to be set apart because Jesus was set apart to reveal the Father's character to a lost world. God's character being that everything God does is based on what is best for His creation. Jesus was willing to set everything aside for you and I. In fact, Jesus was so other-centered in his ministry that when he worked for others, he forgot about himself, his own needs. If somebody was sick or hurting or dying or ministering, he would be totally focused on how to help them, so much so his disciples would come along and say, Lord, Master, please eat, please drink. You've been going and going and going and going. Please take something. But Jesus' focus wasn't upon himself. It was upon others. Everything God does is based on what is best for His creation. In fact, if you and God were in the same room and one had to die forever, the character of God says, you will live and I will die, because that's who God is. He's other-centered, infinite love. He would give Himself for His own creation. Samson did not learn the lesson of what it meant to be set apart until he suffered a great trial. His trial came in part because Samson loved the world and was not willing to let the world go. So he met a young lady named Delilah. And though the Lord warned Samson over and over that Delilah was out to get him, I mean, if you think about it, you know, she says, well, if, if you just tell me what makes you strong, and so he says, well, tie me up with new ropes, all right? He goes to sleep and he wakes up and he finds he's tied with new ropes, all right? And she says, the Philistines are here. They just happen to show up when I tied you with new ropes. And Samson breaks the ropes off. You would think he would realize, well, hey, there's something wrong with this picture. How is it she tied me with new ropes when the Philist and the Philistines just showed up? So she continues to badger him and, he's, and he says, well, if you put my hair in a loom, and so he wakes up and his hair is in a loom and she's saying, the Philistines just happened to show up again. Three times this happened. And you would think, just logical reasoning, a human being would say, this person's out to get me. Such is the deceitfulness and blinding force of sin that when we really want something, sometimes we are blinded in our own hopes and aspirations. And the Lord allows us to reap the results of what we sow. So Samson found out the hard way that he was betrayed. Because his focus wasn't upon Christ, it was upon somebody else. He suffered betrayal, he lost his eyesight, and he found himself in a Philistine jail, pushing the grinding mill wheel round and round and round. And Samson must have imagined during that time, something like what the disciples said, Lord, I am so sorry. 
Lord, look what you did. You gave your Holy Spirit. You made me invincible. You made me superhuman strong. I could have done anything for you. I could have won all the battles. I could have taken Israel to great victories. I could have done everything, and I blew it, Lord. I am so sorry. I was such a fool. Lord, if there was just some way I could do something for you again. And the time passed. And eventually the Philistines had their great party at their temple. And they brought in all the Philistine lords and they brought in Samson to make fun of him and his God. And after making fun of him, Samson goes over and he's resting by the pillars. They're blind. And the thought comes to him. And the Bible tells us in Judges 16, 28, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God. Lord, he says, if you would just give me one last chance to have your spirit, just give it to me just one more time that I could do your work. And the Lord heard Samson's prayer, and in verse 29 it says, And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. You see, Samson at the very end, in reflection and repentance, pleaded for the Spirit of God one last time. And the work Samson did at the end was greater than he did in his entire life. So likewise, the church of God, the remnant church of God, will come down to the time of trouble with reflection and repentance, realizing they've blown it. They have not done what they could have and should have done for God. Why? Because like the disciples, their hearts were overcharged with the cares of this life, with all the things around them, with wanting to be like the world. And they'll say, Lord, Please give us your spirit one last time. And in reflection and repentance, like Samson, the Lord pours out his spirit upon his waiting church. And the work the church will do at the end will be greater than what they have done in their entire history. We find the Lord talking about what it means to be set apart in the book of Malachi when he's talking to the priests. Because in the book of Malachi, the priests and Levites did not understand what it was meant to be set apart. So the Lord is admonishing them for their attitude, their self-centered, worldly attitude. And he says, you offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In other words, you're offering something bad, and you're saying, well, what have I done? And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or accept thy person, says the Lord of hosts. What the priests were doing is they had, you know, all these sheep and goats, these animals for sacrifice. And they were reasoning, well, look, you know, we're going to take one of these and we're going to burn it up on the sacrifice. Let's give the Lord the sickest, worst sheep and goats and let's keep the best for ourselves. And the Lord says, there's something wrong with that thinking, that self-centered thinking. You're only wanting to keep yourself the best, and you're wanting to give me the worst. That's not a love relationship. A true love relationship seeks what's best for the other person, regardless what it costs us. You do what's best for them. And the Lord is saying to the priests and Levites, you guys don't understand. I'm the Lord, I'm giving you everything, and you're trying to give me the worst so that you can get something else. And you brought that which was torn and lame and sick. Thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, says the Lord? Thus says the Lord of hosts in Haggai 1.7, Consider your ways. You look for much, and lo, it came to little. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste. And you run every man unto his own house. In other words, the priests and Levites were more concerned about building up their own house, their own little palaces, and that left the work the house of God to be dilapidated. Well, we won't spend our money on that. We'll spend our money on our own houses. Could the same be true of God's church at the end of time? Could the people of God be guilty of instead of building up the house of God, building up their own little earthly palaces? The Lord tells us what is the result of having a self-centered outlook. In Haggai 1.10 it says, Therefore the he heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. 
And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil. Why does God call upon a drought? So the church wakes up and realizes what is our priorities. Ultimately, the Lord himself, we will see, will solve the problem of the dearth in the church. In Malachi 3.1, we read, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Prepare the way for the outpouring of the Spirit. Prepare the way for the return of the Son of God. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, his people. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. What is a refiner's fire to do? It's to purge the dross, the impurity, to make it perfect. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify who? The sons of Levi. He will have himself a pure ministry once again. And purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Our question today is, do we want to be that offering in righteousness to the Lord? Do we want to have the dross purified out of our own lives and made ready to receive His Spirit. Because it's only as we let Him do this that we ourselves will be changed. In Southern Watchman, January 10, 1905, we read, The last message of warning and mercy is to lighten the whole earth with its glory. As surely as this message shall be proclaimed in all the earth, now listen to this, so surely shall be fulfilled the prophecy given through Malachi. Hmm. Did you ever think of Malachi as a prophecy before? A prophecy pointing to our day. Review in a Herald, February 4, 1902, Ellen White had a dream, and in fact, this is the only place I have ever found this dream in all of her writings, is in this Review and Herald art- article. She says, In the night season I was in my dreams in a large meeting with ministers, their wives, and their children. I wondered that the company present was mostly made up of ministers and their families. The prophecy of Malachi was brought before them in connection with Daniel, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah. The teachings of these books was carefully investigated. Now here she finds a time coming when God's ministry is studying the prophecy of Malachi, which talks about what it means to be set apart for God. The building of the temple and the temple service was, were considered. There was close searching of the scriptures in regard to the sacred character of all that appertained to the temple service. Through the prophets, God has given a delineation of what will come to pass in the last days of this earth's history, and the Jewish economy is full of instruction for us. All these things were closely studied by the company before me in my dream. Scripture was compared with scripture, and application was made of the word of God to our own time. After a diligent searching of the scriptures, there was a period of silence. A very solemn impression was made upon the people. The deep moving of the Spirit of God was manifest among us. All were troubled. All seemed to be convicted, burdened, and distressed as they saw their own life and character represented in the Word of God. They saw themselves in the prophecy of Malachi. And the Holy Spirit was making the application to their hearts. Conscience was aroused. The record of past days was making its disclosure of the vanity of human inventions. The Holy Spirit brought all things to their remembrance. As they reviewed their past history, there were revealed defects of character that ought to have been discerned and corrected. Just like the disciples, just like Samson. They saw how through the grace of Christ the character should have been transformed. The workers had known the sorrow of defeat in the work entrusted to their hands when they should have had victory. The reflection comes to God's people. The Holy Spirit presented before them Him whom they had offended. They saw that God will not only reveal Himself as a God of mercy and forgiveness and long forbearance, but by terrible things in righteousness, He will make it manifest that He is not a man that He should lie. God brings reflection to His people, the people He's wanting to purify. Like the wicked at the end of time, God brings a sense of reflection to them by pointing out, reminding them where they went wrong. Likewise to God's church before the outpouring of the latter rain, God visits them and like Samson and like the disciples, the Spirit points out to them 
what they could have done and should have done for them. And they realize, like Samson and the disciples, Oh Lord, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I have blown it. There's so much I could have done for you. And I wasted the time on the things of the world, on wanting to be great, on building my great house, whatever it was that took the focus away from Christ and put it upon themselves. And they see it and they say, Lord, I'm sorry. Words were spoken by one saying, the hidden inner life will be revealed. As if reflected in a mirror, all the inward working of the character will be made manifest. God will reveal people's characters to themselves, those he's trying to purify. And that's where the reflection and the repentance comes in. And when the church has reflection and repentance and they say, Lord, I'm sorry, then God can work in mighty ways. The Lord would have you examine your own lives and see how vain is human glory. Review and Herald, February 4, 1902. We find in Job 29, verse 21 and 23, we read, And unto me men gave ear and waited, and kept silence at my counsel. Whose counsel are they keeping silence at? Silence at the counsel of the Spirit of God. They waited and they kept silence. You know, sometimes we speak so much that we don't listen. But a time is coming where reflection and repentance God's people stop talking and start listening. And they waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. When God's people listen, reflect, and repent, then he pours out upon them the latter rain. Fact five, as a result of the latter rain, God's people arise as an army with banners and quickly finish their work on earth. My attention was then turned to the company I had seen who were mightily shaken. This is from early writings. I was shown those whom I had before seen weeping and praying in agony of spirit. Do you get a little sense here of what's going on with the people? They're weeping and praying in agony of spirit. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled, and they were clothed with an armor from their head to their feet. Their countenances expressed the severe conflict which they had endured, the agonizing struggle they had passed through. Yet their features marked with severe internal anguish now shone with the light and glory of heaven. Now look at these words here that she's giving. She's giving words such as severe conflict, agonizing struggle, severe internal anguish. Oftentimes we associate these words with Jacob's time of trouble during the seven last plagues. But that is not the context here. The context here is during the shaking before the latter rain is poured out. Before the latter rain is poured out, God's people go through a pre-Jacob's time of trouble before Jacob's time of trouble. And they go through this for the purification of the church so that the Holy Spirit can be poured out upon them. Those who are in agony, who are holding on, those are the ones who then reveal the light and glory of heaven. The numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless and indifferent who did not join those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it did not obtain it. And they were left behind in darkness. And their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Notice here that God does not push the people away. But it says, those who did not prize salvation enough to plead for it and hold on like Jacob held on, they didn't receive it and they didn't receive the latter rain. These are those who wake up as the five foolish virgins and they don't know Christ and they don't hold on. They have the opportunity, God doesn't push them away, but they let go and others come in and take their place. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. I asked what made this great change. An angel answered, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. Brothers and sisters, the loud cry and the latter rain is coming. It's coming upon a people who reflect and repent. It's coming upon a people who with all their hearts 
want to reveal the character of Christ and teach the truth about Christ to the world around them. It's people who give themselves fully and unconditionally to the Lord of glory, that he would use them, regardless of anything else, that he would use them to reveal his character to this world. Those are the ones who will receive the loud cry, the latter rain, and will go out and give the loud cry message. That, this message, brothers and sisters, is for us today to prepare to receive it, to have a, such a focus upon Christ that all of the things of the world will appear but dross to us. We will not even look at them because Christ is more important than anything else, more important than life itself. This is the kind of desire of God's people to be prepared to give the loud cry message and to receive the latter rain. Some years ago in China, there was an evangelist traveling to an area of China that had not been worked. And the area he was traveling to had been suffering from extreme drought. In fact, it hadn't rained there, I think, for about two years. Uh, the people, of course, the children were thin, their faces were pinched, the food wasn't growing. Some of them were thinking about moving away because there was no water, no way to grow food. As the evangelist enters the little town, he's looking for a place to hold some meetings. And he sees a man and he goes up and he says, is there a place in this town I could hold meetings? And the man says, why yes, I am the local school teacher, you may hold meetings in my school. Now in those days, they didn't have cell phones and computers and radios and televisions and any of this technology. So when a stranger came to town, that was a big event. You wanted to hear what does a stranger have to say. So the people came together at the schoolhouse to hear the stranger, the evangelist. And the elders came and they listened as the evangelist taught them this new teaching about a God, a creator God of heaven and earth. And as they're listening to them teach about this great God, they start asking questions like, can we see your God? And he says, no, you can't see God. Well, can we hear your God? And he says, well, God does speak to people. Sometimes it's in a voice, but usually it's through thoughts in our head or through his word, the Bible. And they could understand that. And so as he's telling them all the great things God did in Bible times, somebody asks the question, uh, can your God send rain? Why, yes, says the evangelist, and he tells them the story of prophet Elijah and how the people were gathered up on the mountain to show who is the true God and how God answered by fire and then God showered the people with rain. And as he finished telling the story, the elders and the people says, okay, well, we're going to do that. We're going to ask your God to send us rain. Would you please do that? Well, what was the pastor supposed to do, the evangelist? I mean, the people are saying, hey, we believe your God. Now ask your God to send us rain, because we need some rain. So the evangelist thought, how can God deny the faith of these precious people? They believe. So they prayed there, and the evangelist prayed for rain for the people. Afterwards, he got up, and everything was as dry as it was before. He looked out of the sky, and it was as blue as it was before. He walked outside, and he looked all around, way off in the distance, everywhere. And then off he saw one little, tiny, small, dark cloud. And there, looking at that small, dark cloud, he points to it, and he shouts to the Chinese elders and people. He says, look, the rain is coming. The rain is coming. God has heard the prayer. The rain is coming. And the people come out and they ask and they say, is that small dark cloud way off in the distance, is that going to bring us rain? And he says, yes, the rain is coming. And so as they stood and watched, the cloud grew larger and larger and darker and darker. And soon the wind that precedes the rain swept through the village. And the evangelist picks up his pack and he says, I must be going, I must reach the next village before nightfall and before the rains overtake me. And the people says, come back again and teach us more about this great God. As the evangelist was walking on to the next village, he did not even have time to make it before the rains overtook. And he, stopping by the side of the road, he watched as the rains poured down upon the fields and the countryside around him, realizing that as a result of the prayer of faith, God was sending life to those people. Not just physical rain for physical food, but he was sending spiritual rain of conviction and commitment 
to those people to learn the truth about God. Likewise, brothers and sisters, God is waiting now for a time to pour out His Spirit upon His people, that His people will go out and give the truth about God to the world around them, that in short, they will know what it means to be set apart. But we don't have to wait for some future time to be set apart for God. We can see from Scripture what has happened in the past and we can determine on our own hearts to be set apart now, to be a living example of what it means to be set apart. To be set apart to the world around us, to reveal the truth about God to a dying world. Is it your desire to be set apart today, to reveal the truth about God to the world around us? Is it? If so, stand with me while we have closing prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we hear your voice. We know, Lord, that the world is very distracting to your people. We pray you would grant us reflection and repentance and that you would pour out your spirit, Lord, and that you would be revealed to the world around, that they could see who you really are and that they could be attracted to you. Make us, Lord, as fit vessels for the oil that we might shine as lights for you today. In Jesus' name, amen.